So do you want to cut out some of that stress and overwhelm and not sleeping the night before an IEP meeting? Well, you are in the right spot today because we are going to do a show all about some ninja advocacy strategies. Um, I am glad you are here because that means that you want to take action. You want to make a difference in your child's life and be more confident when you are advocating for your child, be that before, during, or after IEP meetings, right? So welcome, let us know where you are watching from. Say hi so I can welcome you. I am Charmaine Tanner, if we haven't met before. I am a retired teacher, a parent, a author and author of a number one best-selling book on Amazon. I'm a professional advocate and I host a weekly show here on our Facebook Live. So we are doing something special today. We are having this advocacy masterclass on a Friday <laughs> because we're finishing up our five day IEP scavenger hunt. So if you were in our scavenger hunt, give us a shout out. Um, that would be awesome because you guys have been doing so much this past week and I truly appreciate the actions that you're taking. And I know that you'll reap the benefits, your child will reap the benefits when you are an even more effective advocate. So I wanted to start with um, talking about, you know, just like what it feels like as a parent, because when our son was born 30 years ago, um, both my husband and I were special education teachers. So everybody's first reaction when they found out that Dylan had Down syndrome was, oh, well, you guys are so lucky, you're special ed teachers, things will just come real easy for you. Well, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, both my husband and I were familiar with the law. We, you know, knew about the IEP process. But being a parent on the other side of that table was a totally different experience. And it wasn't something that came naturally to us that we automatically knew how to advocate for our son. Well, it became a little bit more awkward when he was three and we were asking the district to support him in a community preschool where he could be totally included versus going to the special ed preschool class. It made it even a little bit more awkward because I was a teacher in the same district where our kids went. So um, I had to kind of learn real fast how to effectively advocate for my son. And what I learned is it's kind of tricky to be able to learn all the skills that you need to learn in the art of advocacy real fast. Um, so over the years, I learned more and more, and I want to share some tips with you today. And I'm pretty sure that some of these will be things that you have never heard before. So I've been saving these juicy tips for you. And I see we have some live viewers. So Patrick is here from Indiana. Hey, Patrick. Um, and Patrick is typing in the affirmation, I will avoid mistakes. That's going to be our affirmation for the day. Um, and if my IEP bot is awake, <laughs> you will get a message from my IEP bot with a link to a really valuable resource about how to avoid mistakes when you're prepping for IEP meetings, when you're at the meeting itself, and what you need to do as follow-up, because sometimes that's where um, the big, right, the big, I don't know how to say it, um, moment happens <laughs> to make sure that your IEP is actually implemented. Um, so yes, so it would be great if you can type the affirmation, I will avoid mistakes and watch what happens in your Facebook Messenger. So let us get in to our content for today. Um, 
And let me pull this one down. <laughs> and we'll bring this up instead. So you've probably heard the expression of, you know, not working harder, but working smarter. And that's pretty similar to what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to, our theme is it's not to try harder, it's to try different. Um, and I know probably all of you have heard that quote, um, and it's attributed to Einstein. I'm not sure if he's the original person that said it, but doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Um, and that's where I see a, a lot of parents kind of getting stuck in that position of, well, I'm going to try this again and I'm going to go and I'm going to keep asking for it. And, and I'm going to, you know, just speak a little bit louder or show a little bit more research, but you don't need to keep doing the same strategy over and over, especially if you notice that it's not working. Right. Um, so you also probably have heard that it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert on any subject. Well, this isn't exactly correct. <laughs> there are two things wrong with that rule. One is the 10,000 hours rule is not really a rule, but it does give you some good guidance on, it usually takes, you know, spending 10 to 20 hours a week for a number of weeks in order for you to feel more confident. Now, I know a lot of you have been a parent for a number of years and you've been advocating for a number of years. However, if you're not using effective strategies, that's where um, you're not going to see the results for your child. So we're not just talking about doing something over and over um, for 10,000 hours. Um, instead, we want to make sure we're doing an effective way of using our advocacy strategies. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Oh, and I put this in to remind myself. So we have different giveaways. And in order to let people that are watching the replay get a chance to also win a giveaway, you have until tomorrow, Saturday the 20th at 11 p.m. Mountain Time to be a part of our show here and I'm going to show you one of the gifts so let me turn around here so one of our gifts that you're going to get is one person will get and it's kind of hard to see let me see if I hold it closer to the camera can you tell I have spatial relationship challenges <laughs> so this is a coffee mug and it says hello my name is that parent and i want us to reclaim that phrase that parent um i think sometimes it's seen as a negative people are you know associating parents that are really aggressive to me i see that parent as you are an assertive effective advocate for your child so tomorrow night, one lucky person will get the hello, my name is that parent coffee mug. So make sure that if you have friends that can um, benefit from our show that you let them know about it. Today, we want to look at productive ways that we can be a more effective advocate for our kids. The first thing that we're going to talk about are advocacy mantras. So let me know if you have an advocacy mantra that you like to, um, to use when you're at IEP meetings. Hey, Sharon, she's letting, I think a loved one know that we're here. <laughs> um, and Erica is with this. Hey, Erica, and Tracy is here. So thanks. Um, what are some advocacy mantras that you might be using? 
go ahead and let us know in the comments. And I got to make sure. And Karen is here with us. Hey, Karen. And she is from California. So thanks for letting us know. Uh, Hazel is with here with us and she is also saying in our affirmation for the day that we're going to avoid making mistakes. So are there things that you typically use as kind of a important saying when you are advocating? Oh, and Hazel's from Colorado Springs. And Hazel, do you, did you know that I used to live in Woodland Park for like decades and now I am in Idaho with our grandkids <laughs> and our daughter's family. So let me share an advocacy mantra. Well, first of all, we want to talk about, I, I love this person's picture, <laughs> but advocacy mantras should just really roll off your tongue. It should be something so embedded that you can just easily say that and it can be a go-to question, a go-to response that can really help you when you're sitting there at the IEP team um, meeting. So one of the ones that is popular and that we wanna make sure everyone is using is when a district says to you, well, you know, that's, that's not our policy. Um, we, you know, that's not how we operate here. Um, and, you know, we can't really accept that at all. Well, that is something that you want to trust, but verify. And um, so what you want to do is you want to say, can you help me understand by sharing a copy of the policy or law or regulation that you're referring to? So if you are like me, when you are on trainings, you might want to take a snapshot <laughs> of this slide um, or a screen, you know, a screenshot. This is something that we want you to be able to say. And Hazel is saying that she doesn't have an, um, an advocacy mantra. So we're going to give you several right here today, Hazel. That's the first thing that we're going to be talking about are advocacy mantras. Chances are sometimes when you hear an administrator or a teacher say, well, that's not our practice. That's not how we do it. Um, the regulations don't, us, don't allow us to do that. Like I said, you can trust, but you need to verify. And so ask a follow-up question, say, you know, I would love to understand that more. Can you sh share with me the policy, or if they're talking about a regulation, can you share the regulation that you're referring to so I can learn more? So you're not like aggressively yelling at them, like, what? I can't believe you're saying that. Don't you know what the law says? No, that's not gonna help you. <laughs> Instead, you have your calm advocacy mantra and you say, please share with me that policy or regulation so I can learn more about it. You are not going to set people up for being defensive and you're not going to set people up for being in a more argumentative state if you say it assertively, but also politely. Um, so maybe that's a couple of new rules, right? Politely and assertively is how we're going to use our advocacy mantras. So let me know in the comments, have you ever used that um, mantra? Yes, yes, Patrick's got a, a good mantra. He says, how does that law section apply to this situation? So, um, you will get probably from that, Patrick, you would get a response of, well, you know, when we read the state regulation, it says for sure that extended school year, these are the criteria. So you, if you phrase it that way, you're going to get a response that kind of rationalizes why they took that position. However, when you phrase it like, please, you know, show me a, or, you know, give me a copy of the law so I can learn more. Then what you're doing is triggering, is there really such a regulation that they're talking about? Is there really such a policy that they're talking about? 
Um, so just twist a couple, tweak a couple of your words and you will get a more effective response back for them. And Kimberly is here. Hey, Kimberly, she's checking in from Iowa. And Kimberly was in our five day IEP scavenger hunt. So welcome Kimberly to our advocacy master class. So let's go back here and we are going to check out our next mantra. Show me the data. This is one that is really important also. Um, and if you notice the person has kind of a quizzical, you know, <laughs> kind of, do I really want to see the data? <laughs> will I know what the data will really show me? Will I understand the data? So this is a great mantra to use when they're talking about, oh, your child made progress or no, they're not making progress. We're going to have to change the placement, whatever is you want them to show you what objective data they're basing that on. Um, and sometimes the data is pretty sketchy and they really don't have a basis for saying what they're saying or a basis for the recommendation that they're making. But you need to call them on that and ask for them to show you the data. Now, the difficulty is <laughs> sometimes they will show parents data and they'll have, you know, a great line graph with colored and dashed and dotted lines. And they'll talk about, you know, the aim line and the rate of progress. And it will just sound like mumble jumbo. So when you say, show me the data, you really need to be able to have an understanding of what good data looks like and what junk data looks like. And this is one of the things that we talk about in um, our membership group, uh, Parent Advocate Trailblazers, because I want parents to have a basic but more you know, thorough understanding than what they have now about data collection and you know, what's going to be reliable and valid data. Um, so if you use the mantra, show me the data, make sure that either you know about data collection and, and how to tell what the scores mean, or you bring somebody with you to the IEP meeting that understands data and what all those test scores mean. We have our next mantra, which is, can you please add that to the prior written notice? Um, and here I have a link and I'll also put this in the description when our video is done. But this is a video I've done previously about prior written notice because that is like a super important aspect of the IEP meeting. Um, when a parent makes a request and the school district denies that, or even if you make a request and they accept it, those things are supposed to be captured on a form called the prior written notice. And you need to receive a copy of that at the end of your meeting. Some districts will give it, you know, like form, um, you know, complete the form right there at the end of the IEP meeting. Some schools will say, you know, we'll send this in two days after we've completed it. But, um, so many times you're in an IEP meeting and you might be requesting something and the district is like, no way, we're not doing that. Um, so you can try some techniques of trying to ask clarifying questions, find out what their positions and interests are, but you usually will get to a point where you just are going to keep disagreeing about it. So instead of spending lots of minutes at an IEP meeting kind of debating something and trying to change their mind and you can tell that that's not going to happen is you can just close the conversation and say, can you please add that to the prior written notice? Um, and what this does is one, it helps the teachers and the staff remember that they're supposed to put things in the prior written notice. Um, 
I know I was at one school with a family helping them advocate and the special ed teacher who was also the special ed director um, just was like this, like, no, 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 we're moving on. And it was like, what? <laughs> so I just became this broken record and I just kept saying, can you please add that to the written notice? And um, I think to this day, whenever that special ed teacher slash special ed director sees me, he probably has visions of me saying, can you please add that to the prior written notice? Um, and when we're talking about the expression and the tone that you use, um, the reality is sometimes it's very emotional, right? When we're advocating for our kids and we can't always be kind of that calm, you know, person that's just almost a flat, flat affect. Um, and that's why it's always helpful to have somebody with you at the IEP meeting. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but have that other person maybe be the one that can jump in and say some of these mantras for you. Um, one of the things that I've learned from an attorney here in Boise, Shar Kwadi, is she does such an excellent job at meetings of just being like this matter of fact, you know, she takes notes and you know, she, sometimes she won't even look up and make eye contact and she'll just say, oh, can you add that to the prior written notice, please? And she just goes about her business. And it's like, it was really, um, she's been like a mentor to me as an advocate. And I think we all need those people that can help us, you know, even learn some additional strategies. So let me check in here with some of our comments. Karen says, I haven't heard schools referring to regulations, more of we don't do that. I don't think they really know the laws and regulations. And you're, tr you're right, Karen. Um, you know, if you look at how much a teacher learns in college about special ed law or about IEP meetings, it's maybe one, one night <laughs> of a lesson in a class. Um, so many times the teachers don't know those. So if they're saying things like, well, we don't do that here, then one of your follow-up questions would be, you know, I understand that's your current practice. However, I'm not sure what you base that on. And so kind of opening the door that way. Um, but I think you need to call them on things like that because just because they've never done it doesn't mean it's not going to be appropriate for your child, right? So we always have to keep that in mind that what the district does <laughs> has to be um, individualized. And so let me roll over here and make sure I don't see any others. So let's go on to our next advocacy mantra. And then in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to pick your favorite mantra. This is a really cool one. This is two simple words, and it makes a huge difference. So remember these two words, so that. And it's like, what? How, how is that an advocacy mantra, Charmaine? Well, these two words make a huge difference. So this is a tip that I learned from an advocate in Texas. And what happens is you just leave this as kind of this dangling <laughs> participle or dangling sentence. And after you say it, you pause, you're quiet, and you let the school team members respond. So if they say, you know, I'm sorry, um, you know, we just can't offer extended school year services for your child, that's just not gonna happen. And then you can say, so that, and then you leave it and they have to come back and kind of um, defend the statement that they just made. So let me think, uh, I'm trying to think of another example. But those so that words can really help you in a conversation. The other tip that I would have for, for families is when you ask, 
clarifying questions when you say a phrase like so that um, that you pause and that you are okay with a few seconds of silence. One of the mistakes that I see some parents making is they'll ask a question and they don't really give anybody a chance to respond. And then they jump into like, well, this is why I'm asking this. And I told you before, and I don't know why you can't understand. And they go into this kind of tirade and it's not helpful at all. You want to have the district be reflective and be able to respond to your questions. So pause, be quiet, and give them time to respond. And our next mantra, and this um, is something that you want to use in writing if, and it would help if I showed it to you, if you are asked to sign a release of information. Um, and for parents that want to work with me as their, you know, as an advocate for their child, I really want to make sure that if they have signed previously a release of information that we either revoke that or we amend it. And the amendment that I suggest that you add is verbal exchange of information only with parent present, written exchange of information including medical records will only be gathered from private providers and shared by the parent to the school district. Now you might say, well, Charmaine, that sounds pretty like formal and like maybe you're gonna, you know, invite some confrontation there. However, what I have seen, and I don't want this to happen to you, is you have signed pretty much a blanket consent for the school to call private therapists and you know maybe the doctor and get some information. And while I think sharing that information is really valuable because we don't want to have the school people have to reinvent um, you know, the wheel and figure out what works and what doesn't work for your child. So I am 150 <laughs> percent um, thankful that we can have collaboration between private providers and the school providers. However, what I have seen happen more than once is a special ed teacher will call a private provider like a therapist or a counselor and ask for some information. And then the special ed teacher will come back to the family and say, well, you know, when I talked to the counselor, they said this, and that is opposite of what you've been telling us. And it's like, what, how could that be? So to prevent that he said, she said, what we wanna do is if you are asked to sign a release of information that you use a statement such as this one. So again, this might be something that you want to um, take a screenshot of. So you have the wording down um, because this really makes a huge difference. Here is a mantra that we want to roll off, have roll off your tongue and be, um, this is something that sometimes you'll see attorneys use. And so it's almost like, let's take that phrase and let's use it to empower parents. So to be able to say, we are ready, willing, and able to, and then whatever it is. Like we are ready, willing, and able to meet with the district to continue our conversations and to come to an agreement at the lowest level. So this is a good phrase to use before you escalate your advocacy, um, you know, if things are not going well and you're considering filing a, you know, a state complaint or asking for mediation or something, you want to have on record that you were the willing party to come to the table and to continue the conversation. Um, and as 
we all know these kinds of things are best if you write it. You can just write it in an email and it still counts um, as far as your paper trail. Um, but this can be really helpful when you are, like I said, especially if you're thinking of kind of um, going up the ladder as far as what your uh, choices are to resolve some kind of a difference. This mantra is, what would it take to, and then you add. So it could be, what would it take to have my child have his needs met in the general ed classroom? What would it take to individualize extended school year services? You pause, <laughs> you're quiet and you let them respond. So you put the ball back into their court, right? And this is something that I learned from um, Kathy Snow, who is one of my best friends. We used to live in the same little town, Woodland Park, Colorado. You might know Kathy. She speaks at a lot of partners and policymaking um, sessions. She's also the author of the book, uh, Disability is Natural. But Kathy would give this as a suggestion to parents. Say, what would it take? What would it take to make sure my child is safe at school and isn't getting bullied anymore? You pause and you let the district respond. So we're going to be asking you here soon, What? which was your favorite advocacy mantra before we go on to the next um, tip, major tip for you. So be thinking about which one is your favorite. Oops. <laughs> and this is for me to mention, we have more giveaways coming. So tomorrow, Saturday, April 20th, at 11 p.m. Mountain Time, I'm going to, well, actually, Siri is going to draw some names of the lucky winners. So let me show you another prize that we're going to be giving away. Um, I showed you our, oops, <laughs> hello, my name is that parent. That's going to be one of our prizes. This is a poster from um, the University of New Hampshire, and I love their stuff. So let me see if you can see this. And it's got an aspen tree on it, which is like one of my favorite trees. And it says, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And this is a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. So you might be the lucky winner of this poster. I want to give people watching the replay time to also join in. Um, and now we need a drum roll. And Kimberly said that her favorite mantra that we talked about today would, I would say that, that, so that mantra. So we've got one vote for so that. <laughs> what, if you are here with us live or watching the replay, which was your favorite advocacy mantra? So we talked about so that, we talked about, could you please put that in the prior written notice? Um, show me the policy, the rule, the regulation you're referring to so I can understand that better. Um, what would it take, right? Show me the data. So which one of those, maybe the other question besides which one is your favorite could be, which one of those is something new that you haven't used before at, you know, when you're advocating for your child. So let's continue on because our next section, and I need to take down the comment. <laughs> our next section is put yourself in someone else's shoes. Now, I know as teachers and as parents, sometimes we have the goal for our children to be more flexible, have flexible thinking, right? That's one of those executive functioning skills that we a lot of times work with our students and our children on. But guess what? 
we probably could use some executive functioning, you know, tutoring <laughs> to make sure that we can be flexible and we can put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And there are some specific questions that Pete Wright talks about. Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with Pete Wright and his wonderful website, Bright's Law. Um, but we're going to look at the questions that Pete Wright talks about there too. First, I'm going to bring up Kimberly's comment. She said, it would also be, what would it take running in second? However, I may be using show me the data at my son's IEP this Wednesday, the 24th, and it's a reevaluation after only two years. So I have a few questions as to the reasoning. So Kimberly, one of the things that I would suggest is to maybe have um, a conversation with the special ed teacher and then do a follow-up email because so many times people don't bring, the teachers don't necessarily think about all the things that they could bring to the meeting that would be helpful. So in this case, I would talk to the teacher and say, you know, it would really help me understand things better if you would share me the progress monitoring data or, you know, the, eva the draft evaluation report before our IEP meeting. And then I would look at, so if the meeting scheduled on the 24th, how many days before the 24th would you like to get the data, the draft evaluation report, if they have a draft eligibility report, ask for those things ahead of time um, because one, then there's more of a conversation that you can have about it. The other thing that you can request is that the teacher bring the actual data collection they've been doing. Also bring samples of your child's work. So you are looking at concrete things when you're talking at the IEP meeting versus just this description of what your child did or did not do. Um, and Karen says, I love show me the data because I don't think I've ever seen any real data given, only in the case of behaviorists. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> and that's part of the accountability. And I have my special um, IEP police hat here. <laughs> because even though we don't want another job, especially if it has to do with IEPs, right? The reality is, as a parent, you are often put in the position where you have to be the IEP police, and you need to make sure that the staff is accountable. Um, and when they are you know, giving you progress reports, you need to know what that data was that they base those decisions on, and they base those judgments on, right? So, um, not that you have to take this hat to the IEP meeting with you, but just as a visual reminder, sometimes we have to be the IEP police. And it helps if you have grandkids and you can steal their toys. <laughs> um, but let's get into the questions that Pete Wright recommends that we use when we are either at meetings or before we go to the meetings. So Pete Wright recommends that we look at the perceptions of others. So how do they see the problem? You want to put yourself in their shoes. And so if you're asking for a one-on-one -on -one aid for your child, and the school is really giving you pushback and putting up roadblocks and not agreeing with that request, think about how do they see the problem of providing a one-on-one -on -one aid to your child? The other thing that you wanna check in with is beliefs. Like, what do you think they feel about the problem? Do they basically feel that having an extra person in the classroom is a burden for the classroom teacher because the classroom teacher wants to have autonomy and she doesn't want somebody else in there. What do you think their beliefs are about the problem? 
And then to go underneath some of that is you want to look at what their interests are. So I sometimes think about like an iceberg. To me, the tip of the iceberg is their position, their kind of their beliefs or their perceptions. Like this is what we think is really appropriate. But their interests are what's under and you don't see that part of the iceberg. Um, so we need to go underneath and see what the underlying needs are that they're trying to get met by kind of holding on to this position. And then the fourth thing that Pete Wright suggests is that we talk about or we think about what are they afraid of if they give you what you want? So think about that. I think a common fear for a lot of schools is, you know, if we give this parent what they're asking for, it's going to open a floodgate and we're going to have hundreds of parents asking for this too. No, we're going to take a stand right here. We're not doing that. So by spending some time prepping for your IEP meeting, it means not only getting your documents in order and having your draft IEP and the comments that you want to you know, say and the questions you want to ask, but you also want to spend some time prepping for your meetings by going through these different points that Pete Wright suggests. And I figure if Pete Wright suggests it, <laughs> we know it's probably the gold standard of one of the things that we can do differently as an advocate. Because remember, our theme today is not to try harder, but to try different. So I'm hoping that the things that we're presenting today are something different that you can try. So you can make positive um, outcomes happen for your child at school. Because we also, right, want to keep focus on the child. It's not about our adult egos, which sometimes get in the way. It's about what positive outcomes can we um, create for the student we're talking about, um, for your child. Those, that's what we, re that's the end result, right, that we want to see from all of this. Um, and Kimberly says, um, I mean the IEP, not the other info you suggested. I will have to email and try to get those also. Yeah, I think getting draft um, reports, evaluation reports besides a draft IEP and also getting data that they've collected um, before you go to the meeting can be really helpful. And Kimberly says, I think they would be afraid of exactly what you said. Yeah, as far as... Um, you know, we're going to open the floodgates and all these other parents are going to find out what we did and, you know, we don't want that to happen. And then, you know, it's kind of helping the team get refocused on we're looking at this individual child and what's going to be a free, appropriate public education for this child. Um, and we're not talking about all the other parents that have kids on IEPs. Um, but... I think doing that pre-thinking about where the district is going to be coming from as an advocate, that really helps me be prepared. Like if I know this is going to be a roadblock that they throw up, I want to think about that roadblock ahead of time. So I'm prepared for some clarifying questions I can ask or asking for examples of what they're referring to. But I want to be prepared versus kind of all of a sudden it's like, oh dear, now what do I say? Um, and so that's what I'm hoping for parents also is this is that prep work that is really helpful. And the other thing, if you've joined us, is we are typing in the affirmation, I will avoid mistakes. And then watch magically what happens in your Facebook Messenger, as long as my IEP bot is awake. So some of you that were here with us in the beginning, if you typed in, I will avoid mistakes. Let me know if my IEP bot responded to you because you should be getting a link to an ebook I wrote about um, 
mistakes to avoid before, during, and after IEP meetings. So let's see. Let me know if that actually worked for you. <laughs> because you never know with technology, right? So we are going to move on. And here is some more information about the difference between positions and interests. Um, and a classic example that you hear a lot is, you know, two kids want an orange and there's only one orange left, you know, in the fruit basket at home. And so they're arguing, they're having this tug of war with the one orange that's left. The mom is trying to like get things calmed down. Um, and so she figures, well, you know, I'll just cut the orange in half. And when I cut the orange in half, you can have half and you can have half. And that's a lot of times how we try to solve the problem, right? Well, instead, if we, you know, the position is each child wanted an orange. But if we look at the underlying interest, the underlying interest could be different. Um, and so the underlying interest for one child could be, I'm hungry and I want this whole juicy orange. <laughs> and the other child's position um, or underlying interest could be, you know, I'm making some banana bread and I want to grate some orange rind into the banana bread. So there could be a different solution. The person that needs the orange rind could get that first and then the whole orange could go to the second child who just wants to eat a juicy orange. So all the time, I, I really find this, um, you know, when I'm talking with my grandkids, when I'm talking with my adult children, my husband, it's like when somebody makes this, like this is the way it's going to happen, I want to know why they are like so stuck on that position. So usually there's some underlying interest, there's some need. So in the orange example, there was a need to eat an orange and the other child had a need to, you know, spice up their banana bread recipe, right? Um, so there's a link here for Cadre and um, I will also put this in the post description and, um, then you can go there. There's like a seven minute video that's really good about explaining the difference between positions and interests. And so Karen says she hasn't gotten it yet. So I'll have to, when we get done with the video, I'll have to wake up my IEP bot. <laughs> um, so thanks for letting me know, Karen. And we are going to go on another giveaway. So we have the mug, we have the poster. Another giveaway we have is um, my Art of Advocacy book. I know um, if you have been a fan of mine watching our Facebook Lives, a lot of you already have a copy that you've purchased from Amazon. But this is the Art of Advocacy, A Parent's Guide to a Collaborative IEP Process. And I wrote this book because I think there's so many books out there that talk about what I think is kind of the science, and I'm trying to see so there's no glare, <laughs> the science of advocacy, which is knowing the laws, knowing the regulations, um, knowing more about the IEP or the special ed process. But what I didn't see on the market was many books that talked about the art of advocacy, which to me are those communication skills. How do we build trust? Um, how, when we're stuck and we don't see any other choices, what are some kind of unique problem solving processes can we use? So in the book, um, there's the description of how to use the six thinking hats by Edward de Bono. There's also a description of the Solution Circle, which came out of Canada. Um, so we talk about communication, building trust, problem solving strategies, um, and those kinds of things are in this book. So one of you tomorrow night will have your name drawn and you can win a copy of that book. 
So that would be cool. And let's continue on because next we're going to talk about forward thinking advocacy. And this I learned from Bryce Palmer, who is an advocate in Vermont. And he is like such an interesting person. Um, and I just love listening to him because he tells these, you know, he's this expert storyteller and you just get enthralled with, you know, the stories that he tells, the advice that he has learned as an advocate and how he shares that with um, other advocates. So forward thinking advocacy. Let me know in the box, have you ever heard of forward thinking advocacy before? Because one of my goals for this advocacy mastery class was to bring some, like I said, some ninja strategies that you probably aren't familiar with because so many times we hear the same kinds of things over and over, but I wanted to bring out some new resources for you. While I get a drink of water, let me know, have you heard of forward thinking advocacy before? And it's like, what? <laughs> So Maureen's with this. She says she has not, but it sounds awesome. And it is. I just, I love things like this. Um, and Maureen, I don't know how long you've been here with this. So I'll just kind of flash this up. If you type in um, the affirmation for today, I will avoid mistakes. Hopefully my IEP bot will wake up. If not, I'll wake her up at the end of our show <laughs> and you will get a link to an ebook that I wrote about the mistakes you want to avoid when you're prepping for an IEP meeting, when you're there and what to do for follow up. So let's look at what forward thinking advocacy is all about. So if you think of a funnel and what Bryce recommends is that before you go to a meeting that you actually do some serious preparation and um, you know this is not meant to stress you out <laughs> it's like oh no but this is to give you something different that you can do and maybe you'll get different more positive results so at the top of the funnel, Bryce talks about developing a strategy based on the facts. So when you're going to an IEP meeting or like Kimberly is going to um, a reevaluation meeting for her son later this month, you know some of the topics that are gonna be discussed and you want to develop your advocacy strategy based on facts. And that's why you want to get things like the test scores and the data ahead of time because those are gonna be some information and right, we always have to look and make sure they're really facts <laughs> and they're reliable. Um, but that's his first kind of step of what you do. So you start big, you develop a strategy, an advocacy strategy based on facts. And after that, you actually write down your strategy because a lot of times, and I can be guilty of this, it's like, I'll think through things in my head, but I won't really write it down. And when I write it down, it makes a huge difference and I usually am more effective and I remember things. Um, the other thing that you can look at is, I, you know, I'll type a lot of things on my computer, but somehow that, you know, pen to paper <laughs> is something that helps my memory get it in my brain. Um, so depending on what works for you, but you want to write down what your advocacy strategy is going to be for that IEP meeting. And then you take that written strategy and now you reduce it. We're making this smaller, right? Now you reduce it to an outline. And then you take that outline and you reduce that to talking points that you're going to bring up at your meeting. So we start big with a strategy that's based on facts. We write that strategy down. 
we kind of, um, you know, I don't know, like even take a small, take a smaller piece of that and make it into an out outline. And then from that outline, we make a bullet list of our talking points. And the talking points are what you're going to be using at your meeting. So this is the forward thinking advocacy model. And I did the handy dandy artwork. <laughs> no, I got a, I got an image and put it on there. But this is really, really helpful as far as instead of just getting stressed out about the meeting that's coming up, to actually take some action and to do something about it. So that can be really helpful. Now, the other thing is I wanted to give you an example of a talking point. So this you know, could be a talking point if you're, the topic is extended school year. My son needs ESY because, and you give a regulation number that says, and whatever that regulation says, um, and because his last three progress, oops, I'm not showing you. Somehow my um, slides disappeared. So let me re-bring those up. I have to add my screen. This is like where technology, is it really my friend? <laughs> so let's see if, oops, I think it's coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> so an example of a talking point, you're going to use the facts. One of the facts is that there's regulations about ESY. So you can say, my son needs ESY because of this regulation number, which says blah, blah, blah. And because his last three progress reports say blah, blah, blah. And the state regulations say da, 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 da. <laughs> So this is based on facts, um, and this is an example of a bulleted talking point that you can use when you go to your meeting. So what can be helpful is to almost put these on post-it notes and stick it to different pages of the draft IEP or the draft evaluation report. So when you come to that section, you've got your little post-it note right there with um, your talking points. Because otherwise, it's really hard to keep all of this in your head um, when you're at an IEP meeting. And another point about the forward-thinking advocacy model is after each of your talking points, you ask, what will it take? So here comes one of our advocacy mantras. What will it take for my daughter to have individualized extended school year services? And then you're quiet, <laughs> you pause, and you make sure that you give them time to be responding to that. Okie dokie. So let's post any questions you have. I want to make sure we see them all. And you want to do this for each part of the IEP that you think needs to be changed or, you know, things that you, you know, are real priorities as far as something that doesn't sit right with the draft IEP that you got or because of what's been happening at school, you want to make sure that there's a change this strategy can be used for each section. So if you have concerns about how the draft language is written for the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, and you want to make sure that there's more strengths inputted, embedded there, um, take this strategy, base it on facts, write it down, reduce it to an outline, and then reduce it further to um, bulleted talking points. So have you ever heard of this? <laughs> and do you think that this would be helpful for you to use for your child? Let me know. Now, the other thing that Bryce Palmer talks about, um, who developed this forward thinking advocacy um, model, is to be real systematic about ranking 
the order of your concerns. And so what you want to start, try to start with is the first concern or issue that you have that you think will probably be the easiest for you to get resolved at the meeting. And then the next one is going to be another item that you think the team will probably agree with. The reason is you want to get people saying yes, and you want to gain that momentum of you're making a request. Yes, we can do that. You're making a request. Yes, we can do that. And that momentum then helps you when you get to those harder issues of, you know, exactly how are we going to um, help the district see our point of view. So that's an important strategy. The other part of this that Bryce talks about, and I talk about body language in my book, is to be a reader of body language. When you see somebody from the school staff, even make a slight nod in agreement when you're talking, he suggests that you continue to glance at them a lot <laughs> as you're going through the meeting. So you want to, and this is like this, I don't know, this, you know, um, nuance, I guess, of finding allies in the meeting. And sorry, I needed another drink of water there. Um, as much as possible, you want to develop more allies each time you have a conversation, each time you go to a meeting. Um, and Karen has a comment here, so let's bring that up. She says, this is great. The only problem I see is that many of our local schools don't provide information before the meeting. Um, and that's true. And I think one is sometimes parents don't even realize that they can ask for the information. Um, and so when I help um, parents like craft emails of requesting to get, you know, draft reports or draft IEPs, one of the things that I suggest that they put in there is some language around, um, you know, having the draft IEP ahead of time will make the meeting so much more efficient because I will have had a chance to read it and digest it, talk to my, you know, husband or wife or partner about it. Um, and I know our meeting will run so much more smoothly. So, you know, like they, you know, depending on really where they're coming from, they might think, you know, this is a hassle. As a special ed teacher, I know, <laughs> I remember those days of trying to get lots of IEPs written or the draft IEPs written um, ahead of the meeting, right? It's like you are so busy. So the teacher might be like, I i don't want to share a draft. I'm going to probably be working on that draft the night before the IEP meeting. Um, and so one of the things that I do is one is the timing of when you ask for the draft. You want to ask for it in advance so you give them plenty of notice, like we really want this draft IEP so many days before the actual meeting. And then the teacher has time. That's like her new deadline is to get it to you. The deadline isn't when I walk into the meeting, I've got my draft IEP written. So one of the reasons that they might be pushing back is like they just don't feel like they're going to have the draft written ahead of time to give it to you. So you solve that by giving them, you know, quite a bit of a notice, like, you know, several weeks, like I'll be wanting, you know, to see the draft IEP ahead of time. Um, and then sometimes it's like they have this, you know, like, um, this is ours, we own this, we wrote this. Yes, we'll give you input into it, but you have to wait till you come to the meeting because we wanna explain everything and we don't want you to have so many questions. You know, We think it's better if we can all talk about it all in the same room. Well, the reality is they've probably all talked about it at school, but you haven't been in on that conversation. Um, and sometimes it's just this kind of territorial thing so if you come at it where like this is going to, 
you know, solve a problem for you, we're going to have a shorter IEP meeting. Um, the other thing that a lot of people suggest, and Pete Wright is one of the attorneys that suggests this, is that if you don't get the draft IEP meeting, when you go to the meeting and they pass it out to you, is to say, thanks, I, you know, I really appreciate getting this. I'm going to need time to read this over before I can really have meaningful participation. So we'll need to reschedule the meeting. And that might sound, you know, kind of um, snotty, <laughs> but the reality is you had requested that ahead of time. You gave them a heads up about why you needed that ahead of time. For whatever reason, that didn't happen. They're giving it to you right now. There's no way you can have a conversation, be reading that draft document and really have meaningful input and participation in the in the meeting. So doing that usually once <laughs> is enough for the school to realize this parent does mean business and we need to be conscious of it's only in her best interest and the team's best interest to make sure everybody has a chance to read this ahead of time. So Karen also said, the parent could send back the IEP notification with a note saying they need a copy of the information before the meeting. And yeah, you can do that. It depends. Um, sometimes, you know, there's kind of this unwritten rule that 10 days before the meeting, you'll get a notice of it. Um, sometimes you get that notice of the meeting only a few days ahead of time. So depending on what the practice is in your school, um, I would suggest, you know, probably a couple weeks before the IEP meeting is coming that you send an email to the teacher and make that request because that's going to give her time to make sure she has it done in order to send it out to you. Um, yeah, but if you get the IEP notice, you know, like 10 days ahead of time, that might be enough time where you reply and say, great, I'm looking forward to the meeting. Also, in order to have it be more efficient, I'm requesting a draft IEP by such and such date. And I make specific dates in there because if you just leave it open-ended, like I'm requesting the draft before the meeting, I mean, they could give it to you 10 minutes before the meeting and technically they... <laughs> Follow through on your request. So when you make a request, make it specific with a date that you want that to have happen. So let's go back here because we have some more things to cover. Plus at the, um, at the end of our masterclass here, we, I'm going to be sharing with you some other ways that I can support you. So I want to make sure that we also um, have time to talk about that. Another giveaway, and I should show you. <laughs> so tonight we'll have another giveaway. And you know I love Pete Wright and all of his books. So one lucky person will be receiving a copy of Pete Wright's book from Emotions to Advocacy. And if Siri picks your name and you already have this book, um, I can still mail it to you and you can give it to a friend. Um, so just spread the love. Um, in order to give people that are watching the replay a chance, I will take names until tomorrow, Saturday at 11 p.m. And then we'll have Siri draw the lucky winter winners <laughs> of our giveaways. Now, the last strategy that we're going to talk about is to find a mentor. And um, as a professional advocate, I... I also need mentors and mentors are also helpful for me. Um, that's one of the reasons I belong to professional organizations like COPA, which stands for a council of parent advocates and attorneys. Um, 
that's why I go to different trainings for advocates and to make sure that I keep up on my skills. So as a parent, you might be somebody that's like, you know, I'm just that do it yourself kind of person. And that's fine. If that's working for you, then that's great. For most of us, I think when we're learning new skills and when we're practicing new skills, it really helps us to have a mentor. Now that doesn't have to be a paid advocate. It can be a friend of yours who just has excellent communication skills or she's a wonderful note taker. <laughs> um, and you bring that person with you to the meeting and you use that person to maybe role play situations ahead of time. Um, but finding somebody that you feel comfortable with, I think is really important. And I wanted to share a resource um, with you, but I think that's maybe on the next slide, is when you select a mentor, you want to make sure that it's somebody that you really connect with um, and that has similar values in you know, as far as advocacy styles um, and also similar values as to what should be happening in schools with kids. Um, and so part of what you want to do if you're looking at hiring an advocate for your child is to be able to really interview them versus just selecting them. Um, and so the next slide has this resource um, this is Cadre, the Center for Appropriate Dispute Resolution in Special Education. And recently they wrote a, a guide for parents about choosing educational advocates. And the link is at the bottom, but it's a very long link. <laughs> so I will put that in the description for you to have also. But it's a great brochure and it tells and shows you um, questions that you can ask an advocate about their experience, about their style of advocacy to make sure that you're going to be a good fit with them. Um, and Kimberly has, she says, what do we have to do to be in the drawings? I had to step away for a bit, but you are one of my mentors, Charmaine Tanner. Um, so thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, so you just have to have been on our live show and made some kind of response because then I can get your name to show that you were here. So just your presence <laughs> on our show, either as a live viewer or as a replay viewer, and your name will get entered. Um, and Karen says... So Karen, if you want to tell us what the S-E-L-P-A um, means, because, right, we have so many acronyms, but that Community Advisory Committee is a good place to connect with IEP parents. I don't know if other states have them. So Karen, I don't know if that's like your state, um, like Special Education Advisory Committee, um, because each state is required to have that on the state level. Some um, Districts also will have a parent advisory committee um, or a special ed advisory committee made up of parents and staff on a district level, but that's not required by the federal law. Um, so depending on what state you're in, you know, that can happen. Um, so yeah, let us know what S-E-L-P-A means. <laughs> and we will all get in on the alphabet soup game, right? <laughs> Um, oh, okay. So she said it's the special education local plan area. So yeah, there's usually some community groups like that, that can be helpful and you can bounce ideas off of. Um, and you just have to be careful as far as what advice they give you and what it's based on. Um, because you can go on the internet and get lots of different advice and input but you need to check and make sure that you really feel comfortable with that person and are they really a reliable person to be getting, um, to be taking advice from. <laughs> so that level of trust is important too when you're picking your mentor. 
So speaking of mentors, I wanted to share with you if you're interested in having kind of a higher level of support from me and other parents is we do have a monthly membership group. It's called Parent Advi um, Advocate Trailblazers. And um, the outcome that we want from you learning how to be a more effective ad advocate is that your child will be safe happy and learning more at school. So that's what the whole advocacy is about, right? It's about your child being more successful, your child getting the education that not only are they entitled to, but what they, you know, the education that they deserve. So let me um, spend just a couple minutes here telling you about, and I need to share, <laughs> telling you about our monthly membership group. So what we offer are live monthly training. So we do a, a live um, training each month. And there's different topics that, you know, have kind of come up as topics of interest in our closed Facebook group. So then I'll put together a training around that topic. Um, the other thing that we have in our group are just the daily support. I'm I'm in the group almost every day. There are other parents in there that are strong advocates for their kids. And what I love is the interaction that we develop. And it's not just, it's not like this is Charmaine's group, it's our group. Um, and I've seen in other Facebook groups, other membership groups where the, um, person running the group will say like, you're not allowed to make comments or answer anybody's question. And I was in a group like this at one time and it felt so weird. It's like, you know, I'm not the only person that has some advice or, you know, answers here. So in our group, we really, um, one of our goals is to build that rich community. And that happens when people are more interactive. So I really encourage that interaction. The other thing that we have is once a month, we'll have a strategy session. And that's where we dive deeper into one parent's, um, you know, coming meeting or a concern that has popped up. And we can kind of do a deep dive with that situation. Then a third thing that we offer each month is a Q&A session. So just time to say like, this has been bugging me. I don't know what to do. Um, and we can have time to talk about that. So if you are interested, right now, the monthly subscription is $12.95 a month, which calculates out to be 43 cents a day. So I think you are going to benefit from being in our membership group and at least 43 cents worth <laughs> of good advice. Or if you want to do the yearly um, subscription, it's $97 a year, and you save $58 if you do that yearly plan. I have on here, chances are that the rates are going to increase. Actually, the rates are going to increase um, by next Saturday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. So this is a good chance to get in on um, when the rates are at a lower price. So what are some of the other parents saying about me and my advocacy services? This is a parent from Texas and she says, thanks for all you do for inspiring me to become a better advocate for my child. And a mom in Colorado said, hi Charmaine, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for your wonderful resources that you share. It has truly helped me with my son's IEP meetings and I continue to learn more and more from you. And a parent from Idaho said, thank you so much for all um, of what you are doing to help us. Your insight, compassion, and experience are unmatched to anything I've seen in schools. I have thoroughly enjoyed your videos and input, not to mention your support of my feelings during this emotional, mentally challenging moment in my life. So I think I believe, <laughs> I know that the resources that we have in our monthly membership group are really helpful. We do have a resource library in there. So there's um, letter templates, like how do you request educational records? And, you know, there's 
at least 28 different specific things that are considered educational records. So my letter that I recommend parents using is a letter that spells out each one of those 28 things versus just a generic, I want copies of my kids' records. Um, so letters like that are in there. There are um, our monthly trainings are always you know, available in the group for um, you to go back and watch the replay. We have articles in there like um, to support inclusion. We have research in there to support inclusion. So there's a variety of resources that we want to capture in our resource library. So it's an easy thing where you can go and access. And it's wonderful if you have suggestions as a member of what else we want to add to the resource library. Um, so let us continue here. So for more details, if you're interested in joining our membership group, the Parent Advocate Trailblazers, this is the link you can use. It's bit.ly forward slash trailblazer membership. Um, and I'll also post that in our comments for you too. The prices are going to increase on Saturday, April 27th at 11 p.m. Mountain Time, so just know that. Um, the replay of this video will stay up, but it will expire on Saturday, April 27th at 11 p.m. Mountain Time. So I want to give you at least a week to be able to come back and rewatch this, to be able to you know, give your friends a head up about the video too. The bonus is if you join our membership group while we're still live here and we're gonna be live for a little bit more to take your questions, um, you will get a copy of this video. So then you don't have to worry about it going away. <laughs> so this is a bonus just for people who join us live today because I want to reward you for being with us live and for taking that action. So. If you want to join us, oops, I'm going too fast. <laughs> I'm going. And then there's an extra bonus, which is pretty spectacular. The first three people who join our membership group get a free IEP review and a one hour phone consultation with me about your child's IEP. So even if you join it later, um, if we're not still live, um, you can uh, join it at another, you know, like later today or whatever. So you could be one of the first three people. And this is like a, a bonus that's worth like several hundred dollars for me to review an IEP, take notes, reflect on what could be changed, have a follow-up conversation with you for an hour on the phone and we'll go page by page through your child's IEP and talk about what's working and what um, could be changed. And Maureen says, trailblazes sound fantastic. Can't wait to join when I'm back home in front of my computer. And I totally understand because <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't like to do that much on my phone. It's much easier if I do things on my laptop. So Maureen, so yeah, just when you get back home, um, I'll have the link there. And if you want, and you are one of the three people who first joined our Trailblazer group, you'll get that bonus. So that's pretty awesome. Like I said, we have more giveaways happening. And um, another giveaway that we're gonna do is a $10 Amazon gift card. So make sure you are watching um, and listening so you can be one of those lucky winners. Like I said, the only thing that you have to do is to have watched our video um, and then I have your name and you can be entered into the giveaway. So this is the um, cover photo in our membership group. And I just, I love this quotation. It says, let us blaze trails so that the path we walk takes in wider and wider sweeps of human experience. 
And to me, that's the goal of our membership group is that we are blazing trails, not only for our own children, but for the other children that come behind, for the other families and parents that come behind us. Um, and that's what I'm excited about with our membership group. So I hope that you um, see this as being beneficial and that you will also want to become a parent advocate trailblazer with us. Um, and I want to stay on and see if there's any other comments or questions. Uh, so let me get a drink of water to give you time because there's a little bit of a time delay with Facebook. So the other thing is I'd love for you to let us know um, if this was a valuable advocacy masterclass. It's a special class that, um, like I said, the video will only be up for another week, but that will give you time to go back and look at it some more. So I hope you found the information that we talked about with the advocacy mantras. Um, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, like Pete Wright suggests that we do, the forward thinking advocacy model from Bryce Palmer, and the strategy of finding a mentor to be with you, to support you. Um, I can do that in a more um, kind of a group situation in our parent advocacy, um, advocate trailblazer group. And I also have parents that decide to hire me individually for their child. But um, I think, you know, for the cost, the monthly membership group is like you will get, reap many, many benefits from that. So I'd like to welcome you to that group. And Maureen says, I would like to thank you for all your wonderful and positive advocacy ideas you have truly turned me around from being a parent who blames to being a parent who looks to have positive collaboration during the IEP process. Thank you. Wow, Maureen, thank you, thank you. I mean, that um, means a lot to me because that means that my values are showing through what I do. And Karen says, thank you again for all this wonderful information. And Karen, I hope that you'll be joining us in our membership group, the Parent Advocate Trailblazers. So I will probably between this week and next week have, you know, at least probably one watch party where I'll bring up this video again. If you've ever been to a watch party on Facebook, um, we can show the video again. And what I like about the watch party is that then I can be watching it with you and I can type in more comments and reply and we can have a conversation that way. So watch on my Visions and Voices Together Facebook page for notifications of a watch party. And until we see you again, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for taking action because together we want to make sure that your child is safe, happy, and learning every day at school. So I'm Charmaine Tanner. I shall see you soon. Take care. And have a wonderful weekend, right?